everybody. Welcome back to the Podcast Daily. It is Monday. It is time to start a new week of Ohio State coverage. So we're going to do that with Jeremy Birmingham and Bill Landis and myself, Austin Ward. I hope everyone had a, an enjoyable weekend watching uh, the championship games in the NFL, getting ready for the Super Bowl. Uh, meanwhile, Ohio State uh, made one move to the coaching staff, which I think generated a lot of waves with a Bill, you made this point. It doesn't seem like Friday at 5 o'clock a news dump for good news is the right play here. Uh, again, Ohio State continues to little struggle a little bit with the PR <laughs> game. That's not what you're supposed to do, right? If you have good news, you don't want to bury it on a Friday night. Yeah, I think I think Ohio State has been waiting for something that they could announce to the fan base or like get them juiced about something because uh, they've all been sort of down in the dumps <laughs> for the last two months. Uh, this was it, and, and why they <laughs> decided to release it at like four forty-five on Friday uh, is beyond me. But it, it is good news nonetheless. But I probably would have gone about it a different way. Yeah, is that, and a, the news is that, that telling? Is that telling though that the fan base, the the thing that the fan base can get excited about is the hiring of a grad assistant? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let's talk about that for him. I mean, so that news, of course, is that James Laurinaitis uh, is returning to his alma mater. He's going to be a graduate assistant working with the linebackers for Ohio State, uh, a role that he held last year for Notre Dame in his first year diving uh, into or dipping his toe into the water. Looks like he it was more of a dive. He was pretty uh, heavily involved for Notre Dame, from what we understand. And with Marcus Freeman, uh, he's got a great reputation. Uh, obviously for what he did on the field, but recruits seem to respond to him as well. Um, so most places in the country, 99.9% of them, the fan base does not know who any of the quality control or analysts uh, or any of the other army of positions, who those people are, nor do they care. Uh, at Ohio State, certainly that's different. We talk about them a lot more. That's also how people found out about uh, Keenan Bailey, for instance, and why he was an important uh, man to promote. But uh, James Laurinaitis is in a category of his own where that would probably have drawn attention pretty much no matter where he went. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly a, a move that feels somewhat like a parallel to Brian Hartline in his career. What happened uh, in the last five years with him is, is obviously something Ohio State fans would love to see duplicated. Uh, James is a guy that, as you mentioned, has been really, really good with recruits. And he's been he was, even as a graduate assistant, the de facto linebacker coach for Notre Dame last year as Al Golden, the defensive coordinator and Marcus Freeman, both linebackers, obviously themselves uh, in dealing with linebackers. But James was the guy who did most of their day to day work. Uh, and I, I expect that's what he's going to do at Ohio State as well, taking over essentially for Coy McFarland, who went to Tulsa to be their full time uh, linebackers coach. So that doesn't really answer the point is it is it a big deal or not it seems like a it's a nice addition because as you said if he's on the brian hartline plan then that means you're talking a about deal. a key okay yeah yeah i mean it's a big deal you're bringing back a guy that recruits know even if he if they don't know him even if they don't talk to him you know who james laurinitis is he's a guy who was uh, obviously a college football hall of famer a buckus award winner a guy that potentially could be an nfl hall of famer uh you you have a lot of you know street cred there and that combined with the fact that he's very young, he, he's extremely uh, relatable to people um, and, and really just a, another one of these guys that you look at and you're like, man, that's a good dude uh, around the program. And, and James, as a as a man, as a father, obviously, is one thing is great, but uh, his his bona fides are pretty, pretty legit. <laughs> I think uh, I think the, the way the, the best way maybe to gauge something like this is. How sad are the people that he's leaving? And <laughs> Notre Dame seems pretty upset that, that James <laughs> Laurinaitis is leaving them after one year. I think he made a pretty uh, important uh, and, and I guess they were hoping would have been a lasting impact there and would have been there for a few years. Uh, but he's coming back home. And I think it's a huge deal. Um, I, I think he's a really sharp guy. We've all spent time talking with James. He's clearly a sharp guy. He knows football. But this is too, this is not an, like this is not a normal sort of graduate assistant quality control job with with the way that the staff is structured and how much time Jim Knowles has to dedicate to the entirety of the defense and he locks himself in that room for a couple of days a week and gets that game plan ready they they need it to really nail the the guy who was going to replace Coy McFarland who who I I think made a, a pretty big impact in his own right in his one year that he was at Ohio State with how well that position group played last year so it wasn't a, a situation where I think they could just go get any old quality control guy and just stick him in that job and not worry about it you are as Berm said 
essentially hiring a, a linebacker's position coach, even if the, the title is not quite that. And, and I'm assuming James is not going to get paid quite like that, at, at least not yet. But but the impact and, and the responsibility on that job is, is, is all the same. So um, I think it I think it was, you know, about as well as as, as good, excuse me, as they could do uh, and bringing somebody in for that spot. And you get the bonus of, of it being a Buckeye on top of it. And as we talked about last Monday at Roosters on the live show, when we started talking about this as a possibility, what you're getting with Laura Nitus is a guy who is now, as you said, the the essentially the linebackers coach. But losing Coy McFarland, losing Macareri, both to Tulsa, those are the guys that did almost all of the linebacker recruiting for Ohio State last year. Uh, Jim Knowles it does some of it when he's on the road because he's allowed to be one of the 10 coaches on the road. But it's not his day-to-day purview. It's not what he's really there to do. James Laurinaitis will fill that spot extremely well as well, also. Yeah, it's it's a little bit unfortunate. And I think that Ohio State had been building towards this expansion of the coaching staff and removing the limit on the number of countable coaches or the number of people who could work throughout the week. They, you know, they had really been loading up uh, with people like experience, experienced guys like Mike Salini, Keenan Bailey was doing that. Uh, as you mentioned, Matt Guerrero and Quinn McFarland, both guys who had been full time assistant coaches previously in their career before taking a quote-unquote lesser role. Ohio State was uniquely positioned to take advantage of that. The only reason I bring that up is it's funny because there's just this perception that the Buckeyes are are lagging behind and everything and not searching for any edge. And one that they tried to, which would have applied to let James Laurinaitis do anything once he arrived, in theory, if the rule had been passed, they weren't able to do it. Nancy was like, no, we don't like that one. We're not going to worry about any of the NIL inducement stuff that's going on. The one area where Ohio State was like, this is one that they're really going to take advantage of, got the kibosh put on it, which is just, I don't know, par for the course ain't, with the NCAA. Ain't that the way it always Classic. goes? <laughs> that's bizarre. Um, okay, so anything else on that? What was your favorite memory well, of James playing, Berm? Uh, I mean, James was just awesome to watch all the time. It, I think the idea of having James Laurinaitis working with Tommy Eichenberg is something that Ohio State fans should be thrilled by. Uh, Tommy Eichenberg will be able to teach uh, James Laurinaitis the, the Buckeyes defense, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, over these next few weeks, I'd imagine those two spend a lot of time getting to, to grunt uh, with one another. Um, that's pretty awesome. But I mean, I want to do. I do want to circle back to the recruiting stuff. There was a a moment in the recruitment of Garrett Stover, who obviously is committed to Ohio State in the class of 2024, uh, the cousin of Cade Stover. It would have taken a lot of things to go really, really wrong for for Garrett to not end up committed to Ohio State. But one thing that was actually a pull for him to maybe consider going to Notre Dame was James Laurinaitis uh, and the relationship that he had developed with Garrett. Texas linebacker Peyton Pierce, who is a number uh, four rated linebacker in the country, according to Rivals.com, was very, very close to Notre Dame and to the idea of committing to Notre Dame uh, in in the near future, primarily because of James Laurinaitis. And I I actually talked to Peyton on Friday night and he said, I I don't know if it's a coincidence that they offered me two days before he took the job there, but. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I, I'm like, I'm like, I don't really believe in coincidences, man. Like that, nothing that happens on accident anymore, but um, it's clear. And, and at that point, I and mean, we're, we're talking Friday afternoon at like six o'clock, uh, Peyton Pierce told me that James Laurinaitis had already reached out to him and told him I'm, I'm taking over to Ohio State. Let's talk when I get there. So it, it, it's been, uh, you know, that that move was was in play and and certainly something that is going to make a difference on the recruiting trail. And I really do believe it will be a difference made in the same way that Brian Hartline has made his difference because the opportunity to to step up to the plate and talk to a kid and say, I know exactly what it's like to play linebacker at Ohio State is a is a very different type of recruiting pitch. It's not about, you know, this is what it might be like here for you. This is like I was I went through this. I did this exact same thing in Columbus. I know exactly what it's going to be like. And that uh, that that's something that Brian Hartline has been able to take full advantage of. And I think James Laurinaitis will as well. Burn, what are those guys allowed to do? Like the people in, in James's position, is it everything short of going on the road to recruit? You're not allowed to be on the road. You're allowed to talk to kids normally. I mean, you, you obviously, when you're on campus, you're allowed to see them and talk to them. But it's really just about building a relationship. And, you know, we talk a lot in the recruiting space about how the position coach re- uh, relationship is probably more important in a lot of ways than the quarter or than the head coach is because that's who you deal with on a day-to-day basis but on the flip side it's like you can't be worried about a position coach because they always leave all the time the idea here and and maybe this is just you know me thinking too far down the road but 
I don't see this as a scenario where Ohio State's looking to help James Laurinaitis develop as a coach and then watch him go be a linebacker coach or a defense coordinator somewhere else. I mean, the goal here would have to be similar to the path, again, that Brian Hartline's taken to where he's at now as the offensive coordinator at Ohio State. So this is a long-term play for the Buckeyes. I don't think this is a short-term fix. Well, James did not want to leave Columbus in the first place. Uh, he had tried on a couple occasions to get in the door and start that coaching career with Ohio State. And from you know sitting in Ryan Day's uh, seat, they weren't sure how fully committed. A lot of these guys talk about being in the coaching profession. They've been successful at the NFL level. Sometimes they just get a little bit bored. Sometimes they've got a lot of knowledge that they'd like to share, but they're not aware of the time commitments. And Ohio State was not fully convinced that that James was on board with that because he had other responsibilities. He was being he was doing a really good job at BTN and growing as a commentator. He was on 97.1 The Fan for a couple hours every morning and doing that. And it was like, do you really want to give all that up to do, you know, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. six days a week from August through December? That I mean, you can ask Brian Hartline about that process and being, uh, you know, hesitant or, you know, unsure about how that was going to connect and just trying it out and then realizing that he really liked it. So we can argue about it, whether it was the right or wrong approach to let let James have that first opportunity elsewhere at Notre Dame with no guarantee that he would ever come back. But he, he has shown um, the willingness and the ability to perform in that job and clearly wants to make that hit the next phase of his career in his life. So as you said, that's a long-term move and the place that he wants to do that is at Ohio State. And I think that's there's nothing but positives for that. It is unique that we're talking about a GA position. Uh, and even Allie was like, how can he be a GA? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Well, the titles don't really matter, but he's just not a full-time coach, but he will be a key part of the coaching staff. And I like to point out when when things happen that are an indicator of the power of Ohio State football as a brand and it's still remaining strength. James Laurinaitis was working with Marcus Freeman, who's one of his best friends at Notre Dame. Uh, he was being courted by Luke Fickle as well up at Wisconsin, one of the guys that he obviously has the utmost respect for and, and who played for Luke back at Ohio State in the mid, you know, early 2000s. To say, I want to come back to Columbus, I want to be a part of what Ryan Day, even there was some talk in the last couple of years that maybe the relationship between Ryan Day and James Laurinaitis went, was a little cold, like, it, it, it's it's a proof of how easily things can be fixed when Ohio State says, hey, this is still Ohio State, and uh, the, the opportunity there is different. Will that brand, uh, Berm, work in the transfer portal? Uh, Ohio State hosted a visitor at cornerback over the weekend. What can you tell us there? Well, I mean, uh, Davison Igbenosin, uh, a freshman from Old Miss who was really, really good for uh, the Rebels this year. It was on campus. This has been a wild couple days for him. He visited UCLA, then Ohio State. Sunday he's at, at Michigan. Um, it's obviously past the time where people can enter the transfer portal, but people are still in it. And this is a, a young man that uh, would be an impact player at Ohio State. I don't really have any input yet on how the visit went, but the fact that Ohio State's willing to take a, a, an official visit at this time in January – is an indicator clearly that they're pretty serious about him. Bill, have you watched his tape and, and watched a little bit of him? What did you see uh, in his freshman year at, at Ole Miss? Uh, size, which I think they're they're lacking quite a bit in that cornerback room. He's he's like almost six three, I think, or at least he's he's listed as almost six three. Um, really long too. So, I, and and you look at the guys that kind of have in that position. I don't know. <clears throat> there was a time where the oh, I say used to have a bunch of guys like that in the room, and, and at the moment they seem to be kind of, kind of light on, on that specific body type. So I think that would be a welcome addition, but also too just like experience. Like they, they, we've talked about this before, they don't really have any in the cornerback room. It's Denzel Burke and, and Jordan Hancock, and like Jair Brown's got a start under his belt, but he didn't play a ton beyond that one start that he had against Wisconsin. And and they still only have five scholarship cornerbacks who are going to be here during the spring. Uh, I'm assuming Davison, if he did commit to Ohio State, would not be here for the for until after spring ball was over anyway. Um, but to go from six to seven would be a huge deal for this defense, just so that they can have extra bodies back there. We saw you know how quickly they got shorthanded uh, during the last season when a couple of guys got injured. So um, and and two, I think you want somebody who's going to come in and maybe pull, like 
I don't upset things is probably the wrong way to put it because I, I don't mean it to come off as a negative, but um, like Denzel Burke is firmly entrenched and there's going to be competition in that room. But but to inject somebody who's played a lot of football, uh, who's been successful in the SEC against really good receivers, um, maybe might light a fire under everybody else in that room to, to maybe get them to understand the urgency at hand and how much better that position group needs to be for Ohio State next year. Yeah, I think that Denzel Burke would really benefit from that. We saw him struggle at times last year, and health was part of that. Uh, but it was an up and down year. The game against Georgia was probably not well, not probably. I would say it was definitely the best performance of the season for him. It was also not coincidentally the healthiest that he was. But the point is that he saw how quickly he can go from being everybody's favorite cornerback to uh, you know facing a lot of criticism, and that his reputation alone is not going to go break up passes or create interceptions for Ohio State. So there's going to be benefit for that. And whether it's whether it's here or whether it's, again, in May, we talked about that being a possibility where Ohio State would – they were going to be looking at a corner no matter what. This situation was not really one that they uh, expected or projected or thought would could transpire in January. Um, as you alluded to, Bill, I don't think given the start of the semester that he could actually come take part in spring ball or winter workouts at this point. I don't think he'd be able to enroll. Sometimes there's ways around that. Maybe Ohio State – would be able to address that. I don't, I can't speculate. And he also hasn't made his decision, but the point is that whether it's, it's here or in may, there are corners that know the opportunity at Ohio state to be in the rotation, not necessarily even to supplant Denzel Burke or Jordan Hancock, but they know that Ohio state would like to play three corners. Ideally um, that there's an opportunity to do so on a depth chart that doesn't have uh, a ton of scholarship bodies. Um, and Ohio state knows that they, they're going to have to get somebody uh, at some point in the portal um, maybe maybe they can address that now and not have to worry about it in May, which would open up the opportunity for them to just focus on offensive tackle. I don't know, but this is uh, Ohio State is squarely in the mix, and we'll see what transpires. Yeah, it's a big it's a big decision though. I mean, you're talking Ohio State and Michigan going head to head for a guy originally from New Jersey. Uh, an opportunity to to pick up a potential starter um, for either team is, is huge. Michigan has done very very well in the transfer portal. Ohio State has always. You know, they haven't changed their philosophy, as we've talked about on this show a few times. They are going to recruit guys that they think can come in and make an impact. And if you can add a guy like Davison Igmanosin uh, to Jihad Carter from Syracuse, both really long, both the same, you know, same body type, talking 6'2", 6'3", athletic uh, hitters, uh, really physical guys, that changes the entire secondary in a way that Ohio State needs it to be changed. And uh, I think it's another indicator that even though sometimes it feels like Ryan Day and, and the Buckeyes are taking things in, in somewhat baby steps. When when the right guy is out there, they're going to go get him. And so now you see how the fight goes. And, um, you know, you could see the pictures from his visit on Saturday. It seemed like he was having a good time, seemed like he fit in there. But, you know, it, it's a new world and uh, NIL matters and everything else uh, is an impact. So Ohio State, Michigan, I think, are the two teams that are in the driver's seat there. And uh, so it's sort of a big Big deal for Ohio State and Tim Walton if he can reel that in. <laughs> you, th you think? When those two yeah, programs just, go head-to-head? -head? Just a little. Huh. Okay, well, let's set up uh, the week ahead in terms of coverage. It's going to be a little bit different for us. Wednesday is the start of the traditional signing period. As Berm has said, uh, on a couple of occasions, Ohio State is not expected at all to sign anybody on Wednesday. Uh, traditionally, what Ohio State will do is have Ryan Day and some members of the coaching staff and sometimes – the early enrollees available. Uh, I know that the first two are probably in the works for Ohio State, uh, but Bill will be covering that by himself, and he's more than capable of doing so. Berm and I are not real excited to be missing one of the key days on the calendar for Ohio State, but we are going to be continuing. We're going to be out in Vegas to cover the Shrine Bowl with Cam Brown uh, as Dream Chaser continues. Um, if you haven't seen the second episode that was released on Friday, uh, check out the first two. They're both available right now. Uh, but the point is, uh, there may not be uh, a live stream of Ryan Day on Wednesday, may not be uh, many other videos, but we will still hop on. We're going to, Berm and I will be remotely listening to the developments, and Bill will have all the information for us, and then we'll jump on with some Snappy Jays uh, in a different format than what we would normally do. Uh, that's what's going to happen in the week ahead, and we're going to juggle it the best we can. That's all we I'm can excited. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Just when you thought like you were done having to do this by yourself and put down <laughs> no. ten recorders, at least you have experience doing it, right? Like it's I just do, like yeah. the old athletic days. 
Yeah, if they, I, I do need to. Uh, I might need to go buy a new recorder. I have, th- I have three in my phone, and if everyone's talking at once, uh, gonna have to hustle. Maybe go buy another two recorders or something. <laughs> Expense <we> approved. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have all that covered, uh, especially because Ohio State's assistants did not talk as consistently last year mm-hmm. as they normally would. Another question for the PR performance of the program. A lot of time for questions. But we're also going to be at Roosters uh, at 11 a.m. on Monday morning. So if you're in the in the hood uh, on the Lontangy River Road, stop by. Uh, we'll be there with uh, Zach Boren and Bobby Carpenter uh, doing our normal live show. And what else we got this week? That's, you know, more more stuff from out in, out in the Vegas. Yeah. Uh, Teron Vincent will also be playing in that game. So we'll try to catch up with that. Certainly, we're going to have plenty of interviews with Cam Brown uh, as part of the documentary series. But we'll try and catch up with Teron Vincent as well. So. That's the week ahead on the podcast. Uh, Thanks for joining us on the daily on Monday to start your week with us. That's Berman Bill. I'm Austin. We'll talk to you later.